Bergy. I'm hungry. I bet you are, young citizen. Have you prepped your food yet? I didn't think so. I think the biggest problem is that you don't have any food prepared at your house. No meal prep? Well, then look at that. Now you're gonna order out, spending way too much money when you know you shouldn't have and when you know you could have been healthier with our sponsor today, Factor, the fantastic meal prep program that allows you to order great high tasting, high calorie, low calorie, high protein, doesn't matter, whatever your heart desires straight to your door in a variety of ideas and quantities. For example, me always going for the high protein. We're on a strict workout regimen now. I need the calories and I need the protein and I need really good whole food ingredients to go along with that. And considering the combination of working with all the YouTube channels, the Mersa, et cetera, and combining that with a dedicated workout routine. I mean, when you think about it at this point in my career, it is easier and cheaper to just heat up a fantastically delicious meal from Factor, then spend the time it takes cooking and cleaning because that time can be spent on streaming to all of you. The scales have flipped to such a point where it is actually behoove of me to try out a service like that. And thank goodness for that, because their options are great, flavors are great, and you yourself can be great by trying some for yourself. And you can get 50% off using code BRICKY50 and heading down to the description at factor75.com. Again, that's factor75.com, link in the description, code BRICKY50 for 50% off. Thank you so much for sponsoring this video, Factor. Let's talk about floors that kill zombies they, they're not real that mother that mother back there is not real they cannot exist in the real world how could they the laws of thermodynamics dictate that in order to function you require some form of sustenance and zombies just live forever it makes no sense zero out of ten Zack snyder is a hack but this is in real life this is a video game. And these aren't zombies. These are Zeds. These are Zeds. And they take your current existence to be very unpleasant. So they are going to do their best to stop you from committing the cardinal sin of being alive. Welcome to Killing Floor. As if you somehow don't know what this game is, you might not actually, because Killing Floor came out in 2009 and is uh, someone who understands video game releases on which COD came out that year, uh, that'd be our lovely friend Modern Warfare 2. Which means some of you are too young to have ever played Killing Floor. And if a recent New York <laughs> meetup is anything to go by, that's a lot of you. So let me go ahead and explain it to you. Killing Floor is a co-op survival shooter game developed by Tripwire Interactive. You play as one of up to four separate members of a British army currently fighting off failed bioweapons and cloning attempts by Horizon Biotech. The game takes place in London, and despite looking a lot better than the real London, it's still not a great place to be. These failed bioweapons, nicknamed as Zeds, are roaming the streets and they have their stabbing licenses ready to go. So you need to wade through wave after wave of Zeds without any help from the police, while a very sweet lady provides you with weapons, ammo, armor, and knives. And if you have your, your bricky bingo card ready, you can stamp the uh, make fun of the British until the joke isn't very funny anymore section, right, right? right there. The rounds progressively get more difficult and the Zeds do too. A variety of which, including Grabby Zed, Stabby Zed, Spider Zed, Sneaky Zed, Screamy Zed, Hypercaloric Zed, Right to Bear Zeds, Chain Zed, and Mild Tempered Zed. You start the early rounds with a pretty general amount of Grabby and Stabby Zeds, but as you continue the Spider Zeds, Sneaky Zeds, and all the rest begin to arrive to join the party. And each of the various enemies have some kind of gimmick that allows them to stand out in the game. The clot is the one spam at you the most, which isn't a problem on its own, but when it comes into contact with you, it immobilizes you, throttles you in the fucking face. Meaning that while they may not be a huge damage threat, it is a threat nonetheless. The gore fast stabs you and has a light charge move, nothing too crazy there. Stalkers are invisible. 
Shocker. Crawler enemies leap at you and are also lower to the ground to throw off aiming. Sirens are slow, but their scream is a large AoE damaging attack and also destroys grenades thrown their way. Siren. Okay, listen to the siren's death sound. Listen to her death sound. You ready? Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. It sounds identical! Scrakes get pissed when damaged and will charge you non-stop with their chainsaws. Husks fire projectiles at you, which forces a strategy change as the other enemies are mostly melee. Bloats have damage over time and screen obscuring puke. And then finally there's the flesh pound, which is more of like a threat overload kind of situation. Now there is killing floor two, which suffers from the same problem of not being able to kill the floor, but it does have a better variety of enemies and strategies for dealing with them. Compared to the sequel though, killing floor one can feel maybe a bit generic in terms of its enemy variety, and few games do enemies as well as Mass Effect 3's multiplayer does, but this is just made up with by the fun act of killing. Jesus Christ. When I booted up Killing Floor again, I was kind of flabbergasted to see how good the gunplay felt in this title. I know that was one of the biggest things the second game aimed to capitalize on, the great gunplay, but I didn't expect the original to be this crisp. The hit detection is really solid. The Z time system having the game go all slow-mo is super fun and giving you exciting moments. And the enemy gib is still just really well done. It reminds me of Left 4 Dead and how good the, the general enemy death was, the ragdolls, how they fall over, lose limbs, etc. Just something about the decapitation, it just feels so good, especially for 2009. Oh my god. It also has a lot to do with the weapon variety. Back then, these were the days where guns actually had recoil that you needed to control. And it also had a wide amount of options. Pistols, dual pistols, lever action rifles, ARs, SMGs, melee weapons, grenades, and wacky sci-fi stuff. And the greatest weapon of all, Potato. Each weapon variety fit to a class, and each class had a tier of weapons that went up in power, but also, you know, in cost. For example, if you had a commando class, you would mainly be using various assault rifles in the game. It starts off as something simple like the bullpup rifle, and gradually makes its way to the AK-47, the M4, and ends with the SCAR-H and FNFAL. With the higher cost came increased power, which is especially needed if you dealt with the more powerful Zeds. But for 2000 2009, especially for this type of game, the guns just sound a little too good. Speaking of perks, classes, it's classes, but they call them perks in this game. This game had a ton of them, and they are heavily playstyle defining. The first game had a total of seven different classes and separate perks. And they start off at a default of zero for their bonuses. It's just like tiny little upgrades. But as you use that class, you have various tasks you can complete. Normally it's something to do with killing enemies, utilizing weapons from that class and so on. So once you increase your level, you gain a plethora of bonuses related to that specific level. For example, let's say you're, you're Mr. Headshot, you know, Mr. Big Time Aim Boy, and you want to be a sharpshooter. And once you reach level one, you gain 21% headshot shot damage with the perk weapons, 10% headshot damage with the off perk weapons, 25% recoil reduction with perk weapons, 10% reload speed with those weapons, 12% fire rate increase with the lever action rifle, crossbow, single, piston, long musket, and M99 AMR, a 20% discount on perk weapons, and a 7% discount on crossbow ammunition. This is all just level one. These can go all the way to level six. Then next thing you know, that 21% increase goes to 140% extra headshot damage. Minus 25% recoil, minus 75% recoil. 20% discount, try 70. And how about you just spawn with a crossbow? Because why the fuck not? Go crazy. And this is just the sharpshooter too. Maybe you're like a, a melee beast and want to be a berserker. Now, melee is a rather tough thing to run with in this game just due to its nature. So enjoy massively increased melee damage damage reduction, and you can't be grabbed by clots. Firebug? Embrace the arsonist in you. Spawn with a goddamn flamethrower if you're so inclined. Demolitionist? Imagine caring about a group 
of enemies. Grenade, 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 grenade. Oh, dumb bitch. And you even have support roles like field medic and support specialists, which are all about the healing syringe and the welding tool. And what's that? Is that is that a mid thirties white boy with too much money and no taste? It must be because I think I just heard a segue. The healing syringe is your main method of healing yourself too, and is one of the best ways to incentivize team play. So there are two ways to heal people. You can either pull the syringe out and heal others, or hit a quick hotkey and heal yourself. Healing yourself will cost the full charge of 100 to do so, but healing others only costs 50 of the charge. So it's genuinely twice as effective to heal others in this game than it is to heal yourself. And the field medic is one of the ways to really amp this up, giving you increased potency, recharge rate, and even allowing you to heal from a distance using medical weapons and grenades. Yes, medical grenades. There's also a welding tool, which is kind of a staple of this game. Across the map, there's a large volume of doors that can, in fact, be welded shut. And these won't hold forever, mind you, as the banging on the door will quickly show. Huh? <laughs> but the better you weld it, the longer it will hold the Zeds back. In games like this, positioning is so often key. Being able to find the right spot to hole up and deal with the oncoming horde is a huge deal. The catwalk in World at War reminds us of this. The weld integrity increases the longer you weld the door and decreases as the Zeds beat it up. The support specialist is to welding what the medic is to healing. Faster welding speed, more carrying weight, and more ammo to hold on to. The pack mule with a welding gun. From there, there isn't a whole lot else to explain. Now it's just the act of playing it. Mind you, while a lot of the footage you see here is me playing solo, because that, that's what I had to do to get the footage. This is a game that is monumentally better with friends. Now, it's not like GTFO, where it's monumentally better with friends and unplayable without. Oh, it's playable solo. It's just a vastly superior experience with friends. Perks, strategies, and maps, they really come into their own with other people. A chill, normal difficulty killing floor match is fun and relaxing. Not too difficult to just walk around farming some kills for perks and having a grand old time. But then you move up in difficulties. Normal goes to hard, hard to suicidal, and suicidal to hell on earth. Hell on earth is where boys become men and men become women, and those women go back to boys. It's a test of absolute metal. You probably were thinking at one point, holy shit, Bricky, that's a big ass forehead. But you were also probably thinking, those perk upgrades are ridiculously overpowered. Percentages in the hundreds and insane discounts? Yeah, that's the whole point. Enemies have more health you take more damage, and you earn less money. This isn't just for hell on earth, mind you. All of this happens when you go from normal to hard. It just gets multiplied the more you move up. More enemy health, more damage taken, less money earned, more enemies spawning too. Why do you think those percentages are so high? Because you need them. I can confidently say, I have never finished a full Hell on Earth round on a game length of long. Maybe not any game length at all. Yet I see people absolutely crushing it on YouTube all the time. The veteran killing floor community is something else, man. A cut above us mere mortals and our peasant level wants and needs. A killing floor veteran is a 38 year old man just taking a drag on a cigarette, seeing people bitch about slide canceling in modern warfare and thinking, fucking pathetic. If you go to YouTube, you can genuinely see how ludicrous this difficulty is, and somehow they make this shit look easy. If you looked up the word gamer in a dictionary, you'd find it has many definitions and connotations. Verb, adjective, slur. But I can say without a doubt that hell on earth players truly classify as gamers, with all the positives and all the negatives associated with it. Completing hell on earth is truly beating killing floor. Sure, you can do it solo or handicap yourself. Special challenges, only certain guns. But as far as I'm concerned, a long 10 wave plus boss fight hell on earth game is when you can put down killing floor and say, yeah, I game. Then, as if it couldn't be any better, 
This is the late 2000s in a Steam game. So you know it has Steam Workshop support and you know the mods are off the hook. Character models, brand new maps, brand new guns, quality of life changes, hell, even new Zeds have been made for the game. When you finally think you've had enough of Killing Floor, the community extends its life threshold. Why do you think it has overwhelmingly positive rated on Steam? Nostalgia? Sure. But with a few friends, the game still holds up after all this time in a great way. And that really is the only hold up with the game. The, the solo experience is fun, but really not what's meant to be the main driving force behind playing this game. This is a co-op horde shooter, a hardcore one at that. The real meat of the game is with a group of friends, specifically friends you played with before. This game, as fun as it is, does not have a serious amount of replayability without them. It has its flaws, don't get me wrong, but it's an older game, so I can, for the most part, move past them. However, in terms of general advice, you should get this with friends in mind if you are one of the few who haven't already. I will say though, it's it's still $20, which feels a little steep right now for how old it is. Like if it goes on sale, maybe like 10 bucks, or offers a lot of its bundle DLC for 20. I'd say go for it, as long as you have people to play with. But $20 by itself feels a little steep, unless you're just dying for a new co-op game to play with your boys. Boys. However, it does have a sequel. A sequel we will be talking about in the next video. Because this one was just on Killing Floor 1. I just, man, I just want to talk about it. Killing Floor 1 and 2, I played a lot of, and they have such an important part in my life. Uh, once again, shout out Howie's Game Shack, uh, Mission Viejo, rest in peace. That was also one of the places I played a ton of Killing Floor at. And Killing Floor 2 is uh, an interesting title. It's both way better and, and not as good as the first game in various ways. And it's a little more complicated to discuss, so I wanted to talk about it. Quick video from me today. Thank you so much for watching. The last one was, was way crazier, so I hope you understand why this one's a little bit shorter. Buy some merch. Thick Brick Gaming. It's in a shirt and a hoodie version down in the description, orchid8.com. Check it out. I will see you for Killing Floor 2 around um, first uh, week, week and a half of September. Love it. Come on. Obviously, you're a skater.